I'm Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One of the Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Ana Mateo is here for a conversation about something white and cold that falls from the sky. Then, Kelly Jean Kelly joins us for the next part in our series on America's presidents. This week, she reviews the two terms of Bill Clinton. But first, the Higher Education Report. The presidents of three well-known American universities recently spoke to members of the U.S. Congress about anti-Semitism on college campuses. Anti-Semitism is the word used to describe a hatred of Jewish people. The House's Committee on Education called Liz McGill of the University of Pennsylvania Claudine Gay of Harvard, and Sally Kornbluth of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, for a five-hour hearing in Washington, D.C. The Republican-led committee chose the three leaders because their schools have been at the center of the rise in anti-Semitic protests, a committee spokesperson said in a statement. The protests are related to the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas. On October 7th, Hamas fighters launched a surprise attack in Israel and killed over 1,200 Jewish people. Since then, the conflict has led to the deaths of more than 18,000 people in the Palestinian territory of Gaza. Protesters who supported Palestine, used the word intifada, an Arabic word for resistance, and the phrase, from the river to the sea. Some people believe the phrase is a call for the death of all Jews. Representative Elise Stefanik is a Republican lawmaker from New York State. Stefanik, who went to Harvard, asked each university leader about how their school would react to calls to kill a large number of Jews, something described as genocide. Stefanik asked McGill, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? McGill did not answer yes or no. Instead, she said the university only considers if speech turns into conduct. By that, she meant the university respects an individual's right to free speech. But if the speech became directed and severe, pervasive, as the president said, it would then be considered more serious. In response to a question about whether a student would be punished for their speech, McGill said it depended on context. When faced with the same questions from Stefanik, Gay of Harvard and Kornbluth of MIT also did not say yes or no. Gay answered that it depended on the context. She added that when speech crosses into conduct, that violates our policies. And Kornbluth answered that she had not heard calling for the genocide of Jews on our campus. The answers brought serious criticism from national and state political leaders, students, and members of the college community. Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, a Democrat, said McGill's answer was unacceptable. He said, talk of genocide against any group of people is all in the wrong. She needed to give a one-word answer. A spokesman for President Joe Biden 
criticized the three college presidents' answers. In a statement, he said, they did not go far enough to condemn anti-Semitism on campuses and calls for genocide go against everything we represent as a country. All three university presidents later apologized for not speaking out against Jewish genocide. McGill called for a review of Penn's policies, which, she said, have long been guided by the U.S. Constitution. Gay wrote that calls for violence or genocide against the Jewish community or any religious or ethnic group are vile. They have no place at Harvard. Free speech experts say the college president's answers at the hearing did follow the current understanding of the Constitution's right to free speech. Suzanne Nussel is the leader of the nonprofit Penn America, a free expression organization. She said, The First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution protects even deeply hateful speech. The congressional hearing took place on December 5th. By December 9th, McGill resigned under pressure from wealthy donors and alumni. The pressure had started earlier this autumn when the university permitted a meeting on campus despite charges that some speakers had shown anti-Semitic views in other comments. At MIT, the school's leadership group called the MIT Corporation announced its support for Kornbluth, who is Jewish, two days after the hearing. It said in a statement, She has done excellent work in leading our community, including in addressing anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other forms of hate. Gay faced pressure from Harvard's donors and alumni to step down, but more than 600 Harvard professors voiced their support for her leadership. They say that the school should not be influenced by political pressure. Lawrence Tribe is a well-known law professor at Harvard. He was critical of Gay's answer at the hearing, but he supported her continued leadership. Tribe said that it is dangerous for universities to be bullied into micromanaging their policies. On Tuesday, the Harvard Leadership Group announced that it would stand behind Gay and she would continue as the university's president. I'm Dan Friedel. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. If you live in a part of the world that is experiencing winter right now, it might be snowing. But even if you do not live in a snowy climate, try to imagine cold, snowy weather. Imagine having a snowball fight with your friends. A snowball is, of course, a ball of snow. But not all snow makes good snowballs. If the snow is too light and dry, it will not hold together. It is powdery. Wetter snow makes for great snowballs. You can pack it into a tight ball, which is great for throwing. A snowball might hurt a bit, but it would not cause a lot of damage. But imagine that snowball rolling down a hill. As it rolls, it picks up more and more snow. It gets bigger and bigger until it crashes into something and causes damage. And that gives us snowball as a verb. Dictionary.com defines the verb snowball as becoming larger, greater, more intense, very quickly. If something like a project, campaign, or business snowballs, 
its progress rapidly increases and grows. For example, after a photographer posted a picture on Instagram of a monkey protecting a human baby, her followers snowballed to over one million within a week. However, when we use this expression, the ending results are usually not good. Something that snowballs in a bad way goes downhill quickly. For example, when we do not take care of small problems, they can snowball into bigger ones. Now let's hear an example using the verb snowball. I have a friend who lied about knowing sign language on her resume. She thought no one would ask her to actually prove she knew sign language, but her boss asked her to. In fact, he set up a big meeting with the deaf community and assigned her to act as translator. She lied about why she could not attend the event, but her boss surprised her with an unplanned meeting. That is when he found out that she did not know how to sign. Her lie on her resume quickly snowballed into a workplace drama that got her fired from her job. Next, let's talk about the expression snowball effect. A snowball effect is a situation where one action or event causes many other similar actions or events, and these actions or events grow and grow bigger and more problematic. Just like a snowball rolling down a hill, a snowball effect is similar to a chain of events. However, with a chain of events, one thing leads to another, but these events do not necessarily intensify or grow bigger. And that's the end of this words and their stories. Hopefully, using resources on VOA Learning English is having a snowball effect on your English studies in a good way. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. I'm Dean Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English podcast. We just heard Ana Mateo's words and their stories. Ana joins us now to talk about this week's words and phrases. Hi, Ana. Hello, Dan. Thank you for having me. Ana, I've discovered that words and their stories often follows the calendar. Earlier this year, we talked about spring cleaning. And it does not feel like it was that long ago. We were talking about warm summer days in the swimming pool, but now, please tell me we're not talking about snow. Dan, I'm sorry, but in most places around the world, seasons do change. So some of our listeners might have seen snow already this winter, and it's fun. I love snow. People could be planning a snowball fight this very minute. I know, I know. I have seen a few snowflakes already too. Anna, let's review a couple of this week's expressions that have to do with snow. The first one is a little tricky. It has the construction of using a word that is usually a noun, snowball, as a verb. Can you explain how this works? Sure.、Uh, sometimes we use the word snowball, which is often a noun, as you said, as a verb. When we use it as a verb, it means a small problem that becomes bigger and bigger over time because you don't do anything to fix it. Anna, that sounds about right. I feel like sometimes. If you do not take care of problems right away, they can definitely snowball or turn into bigger ones. What about the idea of the snowball effect? Where does that phrase come from? Right, this is a related. So, Dan, think of a really small snowball rolling down a hill. What happens? 
Well, it picks up more and more snow as it rolls down the hill. That makes it get bigger and bigger, and that is the snowball effect. Something small gets larger and larger as time goes by. As cold as an image as a snowball might be, thanks for joining us and helping our listeners learn something new today. Always my pleasure, Dan. Thank you. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about William Jefferson Clinton, better known as Bill Clinton. Clinton took office in 1993 and was re-elected in 1996. In many ways, historians consider his time in office a success. The economy expanded and the country was largely at peace. But Clinton had some notable failures, too. He could not persuade Congress to accept a plan to reform the nation's health care system. And, in his second term, the House of Representatives took steps to remove him from office. But the Senate decided not to act. Clinton finished his second term with high approval ratings. Yet, he is also remembered for being only the second U.S. president to be impeached. Bill Clinton came from a town with a memorable name, Hope. He grew up there and in another nearby town in the southern state of Arkansas. For most of his early life, Bill was raised by his grandmother and his mother, both nurses. His father had died in a car accident before he was born. People who knew Bill as a young man remember him as very intelligent, charming with people, and talented in music. His mother told him he would be president one day. Sure enough, Clinton pursued activities that would lead to a political career. He attended college at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where he studied international affairs, led student government groups, and took a position as a clerk in the U.S. Senate. He went on to study at Oxford University in England on a prestigious Rhodes Scholarship. Then he graduated from law school at Yale University. There, he met another student who would be his wife, Hillary Rodham. The two went on to have one child together, a daughter named Chelsea. After finishing his studies, Clinton returned to his home state of Arkansas and pursued political office. At 32, he became one of the youngest governors ever in the country. Two years later, he was voted out of office and, as historian Russell Riley notes, he became the youngest former governor. And that is how a good deal of Clinton's political career continued in a pattern of successes and failures. His successes often came as a result of his centrist policies, which appealed to people of different political beliefs. He also was an effective public speaker and, to many, a likable, charismatic person who seemed to care deeply about others. But, his critics pointed out, Clinton also appeared to make many decisions simply for political advantage. And he sometimes tried to please so many people that he pleased no one. Following a series of increasingly national roles, as well as a series of setbacks, Clinton campaigned for president in 1992. At first, he did not do well in the campaign. He was young, and not well known. 
He also suffered from reports that he had relationships with women who were not his wife. But in time, Clinton began winning primary contests. Reporters called him the comeback kid. He earned a public image as a politician who could survive problems. In the general election, Clinton competed against the sitting president, Republican George H.W. Bush. The two men also faced an unusually strong third-party candidate named Ross Perot. On election night, Clinton prevailed. Because Americans had split their votes among three major candidates, Clinton earned less than 50 percent of the popular vote. But he won enough electoral votes to become the next U.S. president. The people who worked on Bill Clinton's presidential campaign adopted an informal motto. They said, It's the economy, stupid. In other words, campaign officials believed that most Americans cared primarily about how a president's policies would affect their financial concerns. So President Clinton quickly set about making a series of economic changes— They included raising taxes on wealthier Americans and cutting spending to help poorer Americans. In a few years, the U.S. budget deficit was gone, the federal government had a surplus, and the country's financial situation was strong and healthy, although not everyone approved of the steps Clinton took to get there or believed he should get all the credit. Early in his first term, Clinton sought an additional reform he believed would help voters' financial concerns, affordable health insurance for all Americans. Most people in the U.S. either bought private health insurance or did not have any insurance to help pay for medical costs. Clinton wanted to find a way for the U.S. government to support Americans' health-related expenses. He appointed his wife, First Lady Hillary Clinton, to lead a health care reform effort. Hillary Clinton, a lawyer, had led a similar effort to reform education in Arkansas when her husband was governor there. But some lawmakers in Congress, as well as some voters rejected her efforts. The reform effort failed. Clinton also struggled in some early foreign policy moves. He withdrew American troops from Somalia after their humanitarian efforts there turned into a bloody military struggle. He was also criticized for failing to intervene quickly in the genocide in Rwanda, where hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Later, Clinton won praise for some of his foreign policy. His government helped restore the elected president in Haiti after a coup. It also helped negotiate peace agreements in Bosnia and Ireland. And it cooperated with NATO to intervene in the Kosovo area and stop attacks on Albanians there. In general, Clinton believed the U.S. had an important role to play in maintaining peace and protecting human life around the world. At the same time, he did not want to use too many American resources to do so. He aimed to cooperate with other nations and to set moderate goals. As usual, Clinton adopted an approach that was not too extreme on one side or another.
During most of his time as president, Clinton had been under investigation. Federal judges had appointed a special counsel, named Kenneth Starr, to find out if the president had committed any crimes related to financial investments before he took office. During the investigation, Starr learned that the president had been having a sexual relationship with a young woman who worked in the White House. Starr asked Clinton about the affair under oath. Later, Starr accused Clinton of lying about his relationship with the woman. Starr said that Clinton had also tried to prevent others from telling the truth about some of his activities. In time, the president publicly admitted the relationship, and he apologized to voters and his family. But he said he had not lied or told anyone else to lie for him. Lawmakers in the House of Representatives did not accept Clinton's defense. They advanced two articles of impeachment. Lawmakers in the U.S. Senate then considered the case. It is their job to examine the evidence and decide whether to remove a president from office. A majority did not believe the actions Clinton was accused of were serious violations against the country. They voted to acquit Clinton of the charges and permit him to continue as president. In the U.S., a president can serve only two full terms. After his second, Bill Clinton and his wife settled in a town outside New York City. In time, Hillary Clinton became the U.S. Senator from New York, as well as a Secretary of State and the Democratic Party's candidate for president. Bill Clinton, like many other U.S. presidents, wrote about his experiences, and helped develop his presidential library. He also worked on humanitarian, health, and economic issues with his family's organization, the Clinton Foundation. For many, Clinton's time in office is remembered as a mixed experience. The economy was at one of its strongest in U.S. history. Most people could find jobs, and many Americans bought homes for the first time. In the mid-1990s especially, the Internet and other new developments created a technology boom. In addition, Clinton was an effective public speaker, and he inspired new groups of people to support his Democratic Party. Many voters approved of his appointments of women and minorities to positions of power in his government. They also liked the steps he took to reduce the use of handguns, protect the environment, and provide paid time off work for some people to care for themselves or their families. But both Democrats and Republicans found fault with some of Clinton's efforts. And even his supporters note that the president had to spend much of his time in office answering charges of wrongdoing. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's the Learning English Podcast for today. Thank you, Kelly, for that report. And thanks to our VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. I'm Katie Weaver. 
And I'm Dan Friedel.